Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for waking up for the keynote and for my talk. And thank you for coming to a talk about community. I think code is often the easy part of our jobs. And I really appreciate that you're taking the time to spend the morning with me as we talk about some of the issues that are the harder parts of our jobs, uh, the, the people parts and not the code parts. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful that you're choosing to spend your time here this morning with me talking about the Scala community. Uh, my name is Kelly Robinson. Uh, I work at a company called Twilio. You might know us from your lanyards. Uh, we are a communications company that builds APIs for adding things like SMS, email, voice, video, authentication into your applications. Uh, I work on the developer relations team at Twilio. I specifically support the account security products there. Uh, and so my job is about being in the community. Uh, this is something that I've been doing for about two years now. Uh, before that, I was working in a lot of Scala roles, uh, which is why I'm involved with all of the this lovely people in the Scala community. Uh, but my, my job requires that I do things like writing documentation and getting developer feedback on our products. And so I speak at technical events like this on technical topics. Uh, I attend events like Scala Days. I go to meetups. I write blog posts. But I want to tell you about how I got here, because my job started out in normal engineering, I guess you could say. I haven't been doing this community work full time for all of my career. So in 2013, I attended a coding boot camp. This is not something that I talk about a lot. Uh, there's a stigma around coding boot camps uh, that you know maybe they don't have the same type of educational background as somebody that got a traditional CS background. Uh, in my coding career, I have been worried about being taken seriously. And so I didn't talk about the fact that I did a coding boot camp often because I was worried that that would let people that would form a different opinion of me, that maybe they wouldn't take me as seriously. But our industry is flooded with boot camp grads now, especially in the US. Uh, and there's people like me that have been doing professional programming now for six years, which in San Francisco basically makes you a distinguished engineer. So I shouldn't be ashamed of this anymore, right? Uh, but I was really lucky after uh, going to the boot camp uh, where I studied Python and Go, I got hired by this company to write Scala. And I was lucky that I had some very patient mentors and some people that were willing to give me very thorough code reviews, that were willing to teach me what it was like to work in a professional organization, that would teach me what it was like to write production code. And it was, it was a really great experience. Uh, but when I was at Versal in 2013, I was living in San Francisco at the time, and I went to my first Scala meetup. I was writing Scala code, and I wanted to learn a little bit more. And this was the Scala meetup in 2013, where Rod Johnson was on a panel defending whatever he had talked about in his keynote at Scala Days in 2013. I wasn't at Scala Days in 2013, if any of you were. Apparently, it was very controversial. And so they actually invited him to a follow-up panel to basically defend what he was talking about. I didn't really understand any of the controversy. I was very new to all of this. But I showed up at this meetup. I was really eager to like, meet people and talk to people. Uh, I didn't know anyone there. And so I was kind of like standing awkwardly uh, by myself. And somebody came up to me and talked to me. And they asked me to refill the coffee. I didn't go back to a Scala meetup for three years. That was a really discouraging experience for me, because when you're in that kind of environment and you're being vulnerable and you're putting yourself out there, the last thing that you want to do is be mistaken for the kitchen staff. So I spent a couple of years writing Scala code. And then I wanted to see how another company did, did production engineering. And so I went over to this company called Share3, where I did ad tech for a few years. Uh, I did a lot of data engineering and distributed systems there. That was where I learned a lot about how to work with Spark. Uh, and it was really interesting for me because I had been the junior engineer at Versal. I was the person that. Uh, I was, I was always asking the questions, right? Like, I was working with other more senior engineers. But when I went over to share through, all of a sudden, people were asking for my advice. I was the one that came in with a lot of Scala knowledge. Most of the other engineers on our team had only done Java previously and had picked up Scala on the job like I had it in my previous role. And so suddenly, I was in this position of being the person that could give other people advice 
And that was really, really empowering for me because I got to be in kind of this new level, this new level of my career, where all of a sudden I was giving back. And it was while I was at Share Through that I kind of worked up the courage to say, I'm going to start spreading this knowledge to other people. This is something that I now have enough confidence in my abilities that this is something that I want to share with others. And so I worked up the courage to submit a conference talk proposal to Scala Days in 2016. It got accepted, and I gave my first ever conference talk about three years ago at Scala Days in New York City. This was three years ago, or three years into my career as a software engineer. I was still really worried about being taken seriously. And I really wanted to present myself as somebody with a lot of technical credibility. I didn't want to be mistaken for the kitchen staff. And so I gave this talk called Why the Free Monad Isn't Free. How many of you know what free monads are? Like half of you that are raising your hands are lying right now. Like nobody actually knows what this stuff is, right? Like I didn't know what this was when I submitted the talk and I, I did this thing that I do for my talks so that I like to call talk-driven development, which is if there's something I want to understand, I force myself to explain it to other people, and then I make sure that I understand it. And so I worked really hard on this talk. I was very, very terrified. I, I was terrified of the trolls. I was terrified of people being mean to me. I was terrified of people not taking me seriously. But I prepped the hell out of that talk, and I, I got through it. Uh, and people liked it. it. It went over pretty well. Um, Martin Ordushki was in the audience for that talk, which I'm very glad I didn't know until after the talk was over. Uh, I'm still really, really proud of what I did there and the people that it's hopefully helped. And I tell this story because this was my first real introduction into the Scala community. It took me three years to get to that point because of that one bad experience that I had had. And at this point, like, this is 2016, I've been working in Scala for three years. Like, I was one of the more experienced Scala developers in the industry, and I, I, I didn't really understand that I had something to share. And so what I want to talk about today is ways that I can encourage all of you to participate in this community, encourage people to participate and share their knowledge without being as scared as I was, and hopefully we can make the community a place where people will be encouraged and want to, to participate in that way. Uh, but there was something else I noticed at Scala Days in 2016, which was there weren't a lot of women at the conference. There especially weren't a lot of women speakers. There were actually three women speakers out of 55, I counted. Uh, it was me, it was Heather Miller, and there was one other. And so we were the representation on stage. And so when I got back to San Francisco after that conference, I was really energized, and I decided that I wanted to start this program called Scala Bridge. Uh, and ScholarBridge's mission is to build an inclusive Scala community with introductory programming workshops for underrepresented groups. This is something that is a model that's been done in other language communities. There's actually an overarching uh, organization called Bridge Foundry that helps organize a lot of these different language bridges. And so there's a Ruby on Rails bridge, a Go bridge, a Mobile bridge, an Elm bridge, and there's a Scala bridge. And so with the help of the Bridge Foundry organization, we got the workshops off the ground. And I don't have the exact numbers, but since 2017, when we did the first workshop in San Francisco, we put on over two dozen workshops in many, many countries. And so a big round of applause to everybody that's been involved with that. Thank you very much for helping out. Uh, but in 2016, there was something else that was introduced to the community that is arguably even more important, and that was the Scala Center. Uh, and the Scala Center is uh, for open source and education, as many of you know. And uh, education is something that I think underlies both of these organizations that I think is crucial to developing a strong community. Because the community is all of us, and I want all of us to feel welcome. So this quote is actually directly stolen from Heather's talk about uh, introducing the Scala Center in 2016. Uh, and I think it still remains true, right? Like, you, we all have to be a part of this to make the community great. Uh, but if you're not somebody that spends a lot of time in the work or at conferences or what you might consider like the wider language community, community is also applicable in your workplace. The things that I'm going to talk about today are equally relevant uh, in your offices. Cultivating a supportive team environment isn't that different from cultivating a supportive wider language community. 
Conferences like Scala Days are a great place to engage with other developers. Uh, and this is also true of your regional meetup. If you're not somebody that has the ability to come to Switzerland for a lot of these events, a lot of times there are these user groups in your communities that you live in where you can engage with other people. But there is a place that we're all engaging, and that's online. Uh, and places like Stack Overflow, GitHub, Gitter, Slack, uh, they're accessible to anyone, and while they create a lot of opportunities, they also breed miscommunication and hostility. And I think we saw that in the keynote this morning, that open source communities aren't necessarily always the most welcome, and there's a lot of ways to misinterpret what people say. There's a lot of rude behavior that happens there, and so there are steps that we can take to help mitigate this. But how do we do it? How do we build a better community? And the answer is that we can't do it alone. We all have to take steps to make this a more welcoming place. But I have three recommendations that I want to share with you. Uh, and these are by any means not an exhaustive list. Uh, there's obviously a lot of things that we can do as a community to make the place, uh, places that we operate more welcoming. Uh, but the three things that I want to focus on are practicing empathy, building trust, and empowering others. So we'll start with practicing empathy. Empathy is this idea that you have the ability to understand others' emotions. Uh, more than that, it's about being able to understand and react to others' needs and concerns and how they are reacting emotionally. Empathy is a key part of emotional intelligence. And this is a hard thing to master, but it's something that we can all actively work on because empathy is a skill that can be developed. It's not something that everybody is born with. It's something that we can work on. And I'm going to tell you a couple of tricks that I've learned how we can do that. Uh, but I, I want to share this quote from uh, Mike Scher, who is the creator of shows like Parks and Recreation and The Good Place. He's a personal hero of mine. I love this guy. Uh, and so he did a Reddit AMA last year where somebody asked, if you had a machine that could dispense an infinite amount of anything, what would that be? And his answer was empathy. And you can see this reflected in the stories that he tells. If you've ever watched one of these shows that he's created, you find yourself rooting for all of the characters because he has a great way of developing their interpersonal relationships. He has a great way of getting the audience to empathize with, empathize with their problems. And he understands what the audience wants and what the audience is concerned about so that he can reflect that in the characters that he develops. And this is important because understanding your audience, understanding the people that you're catering to, is incredibly lucrative. Empathy is lucrative. Mike Scher just signed an $125 million deal to work at NBC for the next five years. This is the type of thing that is going to grow your business and make people want to work with you. So in your own life, some of the ways that you can practice empathy is to start by asking why. And especially instead of asking how first. I think as Scala developers and software engineers, a lot of times we get really excited by asking how. How are we going to build this? How are we going to decide what tools to use? What frameworks are we going to implement? Which libraries are we going to import? These are the questions that we often immediately jump to, and I'm very guilty of this as well. But if you want to start and empathize with the, the people that you're building for, you need to start by asking why you're building the things that you're building. And really dig into this. If you've ever done a post-mortem exercise, there's a, a famous method of doing this called five whys, which is basically you ask why things happen at least five times to try to get to the root cause. And it's really easy to snap to judgment about why things are built the way that they are, but this is another way that you can ask. Start by asking why to hopefully empathize with your coworkers. I mean, is there anything more annoying than somebody coming into your project and just shitting over everything that you've built? So if somebody comes in and they're like, oh well, why are you using Scalatra? That's terrible. This is a real thing that somebody said once at one of my companies. That person was me. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't ask why. I was just like, this is garbage. What are you doing? Uh, but the answer that I got when I finally, somebody explained why without me actually asking was that it was an internal service. At the time that it was built, Scalatra made sense. It was also an important service, but it only got about 12 requests per month. It wasn't broken, and so nobody needed to fix it. So don't do this. Uh, but 
but this also gets into the answers that don't have as much of like a business case behind them, right? Uh, so there was a project at ShareThrough that inspired my free monads talk because it was using free monads all throughout it. And when I finally asked why that was happening, the answer was that the developer who built it just kind of felt like it. There wasn't really a business case behind that decision. Uh, and I think this is something that is, it points to you know, the more dangerous aspects of how we get into these types of problems. So think about Jurassic Park, right? Like They were so busy thinking about whether or not they could that they never stopped to think whether or not they should. So this is something that I like to remind people of, that just because you can build something using these tools and the hottest, latest framework doesn't mean that you necessarily should. It's really easy to over-engineer things, especially in Scala, where there's a million ways to build everything, right? Uh, so people have very strong opinions about how to build different types of software in Scala. There's the, you know, the pure functional camp. There's the, we just came from Java, and so we're going to write more Java Scala camp. There's, there's all these different styles of Scala, and it's really easy to get into a mindset of, well, it has to be a certain way. But I want to encourage you to think about more practical solutions and keep this question, what does the customer need, in the front of your mind? And this can be challenging, right? Like, Scala is mostly a back-end language. Sometimes the end-user customer is so many levels removed from what you're actually working on that you might have, not have like a direct line of communication with the stuff that uh, they're concerned about. Uh, but I think it's essential to understand how what you're building is affecting the people who are using it, even if those people are other engineers at the company. Maybe you're cons are building an internal API that your front-end developers are consuming from some kind of front-end application. You can talk to them about how they're consuming that, and you can talk to them about how they're then presenting the data. There are ways to have these conversations to build these em this empathy with your customers and with the other people that are using the software that you've built. And this is really important because it's essential to understand what you're building and how it's going to be used. There's privacy and security implications with a lot of this. There's ethical implications. And then this does tie back to a lot of the practicality and also long-term planning, right? Like if you are building something that you know a customer needs ASAP because of X, Y, and Z, like this is something that we run into in industry and sometimes you just have to do that. But if you know that in six months you're going to have a slightly different use case or maybe there's regulation that is coming down the line, you might have to think ahead about how you're going to have to rebuild something, or the fact that it might be easier to scrap the small project that you have and, and do it differently. Think about the, the types of people that you're going to be working with and, and how they're going to be able to onboard into that project. There's a lot of considerations that you can make in these types of situations to help uh, make a better product. Uh, and one reason that this is hard is because Scala is an academic language. Uh, it was developed here at this university uh, because uh, computer scientists write, like writing languages. Uh, and as far as I know, it wasn't initially written to solve a specific use case. Uh, I don't know if Martin's in here, but you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, the majority of the people in here probably work in industry, uh, and we do have a customer at the other end. Uh, and you know what that customer doesn't care about, they don't care about how pure your code is. Like, you might care about that, and I'm not saying that that doesn't matter, but you also need to keep the customer in mind. Another important thing to consider is, uh, and this will help you practice empathy uh, with your coworkers and your customers, uh, is understanding someone's background. Uh, and this will help you engage with them, especially if you're trying to explain something or teach something. So if you consider someone's language background, I'm going to explain a Scala concept much differently to somebody who comes from Java than somebody who comes from JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript has much more uh, functional paradigms, especially lately. I know Java's moving into that, but we know the people that have come to Java and how they approach Scala, and there's different ways that you can uh, introduce new concepts to people based on where they're coming from. Maybe those people have only worked at large companies uh, and therefore are specialized in one or two things. Maybe they're not familiar with the type of build systems that you're using in your startups. Uh, maybe they came from an enterprise software background where they had uh, a lot of closed source that they were working with. So you can start to think about these different ways that you can engage with the types of people that you're working with to better understand and empathize with them. My second recommendation is all about building trust. 
Uh, and it's harder for people to feel welcome in your space if they can't trust that they will be respected in your space. Uh, and building trust is crucial to building a supportive and strong community. A big way to destroy trust is to pretend like you know everything. Uh, so my therapist actually gave me this thought exercise, which was, if you give someone a project, who are you going to trust more? The person that's like, yep, cool, got it, and walks away, or the person that like, considers it for a minute and then asks for help and questions about the things that they don't understand. And I think we tend to trust people that actually ask the thoughtful questions. Uh, the key here is that asking thoughtful questions actually makes you seem smarter. Uh, no one knows everything, and no one should have to pretend like they do. And this isn't obvious, right? Uh, this is actually hard to ask good questions. So here's a great framework that I stole from my friend Catherine on how to ask good questions. Uh, and so her framework is this. It says, I'm trying to do something so that I can achieve something else. I'm running into insert your problem here. And here are the things that I've tried to fix it. There's a lot of benefits of using a framework like this. Uh, so it clarifies your thought process. It doesn't waste someone else's time, because if you can ask a question with these types of uh, thoughtful considerations in it, the person that you're asking that to is like, oh, this person's thought through this, right? Like, and it's also going to be, make it easier for them to help you. It showcases the effort that you've done. So even if you don't know something, like there's no shame in not knowing something, but then you're also level setting with what you do know and what you do understand. And finally, in the process of doing something like this, of constructing this type of question, uh, this is like the rubber duck method, right? Like, by the time you end up at the end of this question, you might answer your own question. So a way that I use this recently, uh, I'm trying to edit our auto-generated documentation. There was a bunch of code repositories that were needed to do that so that I can fix a broken code sample. I'm running into some failing tests. I've looked at the equivalent uh, product documentation in a different product, and I tried editing these two files. And when I presented uh, somebody on our team with this, they were like, oh, okay, well, you didn't need to ed edit X and Y files, you actually needed to edit Z file. And that's why the test is breaking. And so this is something that made it a lot easier for that person to help me and made it easier for me to get my question answered. But this type of exercise isn't just for junior developers or new people to the language or the industry. Uh, asking for help is really hard. So if you're in a position of power, if you have senior in your title, uh, you really need to model this behavior. And that's this whole idea that reciprocity builds trust. Uh, you can show people that it's normal to ask for help, show people that it's normal to ask questions, ask clarifying questions. Nobody knows every acronym. Uh, inserting yourself to get clarity will help other people in the room. Uh, I work in a lot of security-related uh, stuff now, and in security, there's this whole industry behind social engineering. And social engineering is the idea that I can call and try to steal my friend's information by convincing the Verizon or the, the telecom agent that I am either her or her mother or something like that, but you have to build trust with the person that you're trying to exploit in that situation. And the people who study this understand the psychology behind this of the reciprocity that you need to do in order to gain someone's trust. And so that can be as simple as, oh, well, I see that I'm running this version of my operating system. What, what version are you running? And so by offering up information about myself, people are more willing to offer up information about them. And this is a way that you can build trust, that people are going to assume that you know what you're talking about, uh, but also assume that it's safe to share that kind of information with you. And this is all about making these more welcoming spaces. Another trick to building trust is to avoid feigning surprise. And so an example of this is uh, feigning surprise happens when I'm like, uh, somebody says to me, hey, Kelly, you know, like, I've been using Apache Spark, and I'm like, what's, what's that? And they're like, you don't know what Apache Spark is? Like, nobody likes to be reacted to like that. And so instead of feigning that type of surprise, the way that you can answer those types of situations, oh, it's cool, it's a data library that we've been using to process large-scale data. Let me, let me tell you about it. There's a lot of ways to react to those types of situations that don't essentially diminish and shame people for not having that kind of knowledge. Uh, this trick came from the, uh, the uh, Recurse Center handbook. The Recurse Center is this programmer retreat in New York City where experienced programmers can go for three months to just kind of learn something new. Uh, it's really cool, and I suggest that you check it out. 
uh, but I don't think that I can understate, uh, overstate how important vulnerability is in building trust. Uh, being vulnerable and authentic is one of the most effective ways that I've seen to gain someone's trust. Everybody loves a good story about failure. And so I really want to encourage you to admit when you don't know something, because this does something that helps normalize a growth mindset of like, we're all programmers, none of us know everything, we're all learning all the time, that's basically what we're paid to do, is be professional learners and Googlers, right? Uh, let people see you make mistakes. Uh, Noel Welsh gave a really great talk yesterday about teaching Scala. Uh, and he mentioned that live coding is a really great way to teach other people uh, how you do your job. Uh, because it puts you in a very vulnerable situation, right? People see you mess up, but they also see how you recover from those mistakes. And so it normalizes this idea that you're going to run into a bunch of compiler errors before you get something working. It shows how you can debug that code. It teaches you about the tools that you're using. Uh, and that's a really powerful way for people to start to build confidence in recovering from mistakes and normalizing the fact that everybody is going to be making a lot of mistakes in their daily jobs. I had a mentor at my first job that I would ask all of my questions to, and so for the first couple of months, every time I ran into something that I didn't know how to do, I would ask them about it. And then there was one day, probably about two months in, that I went over to him and I was like, this isn't working, like, what's going on? He was like, oh, I don't know, let's figure it out. And he like, takes the error message I was getting, types it into Google, shows me how to like find the best Stack Overflow answer, and I was like, gosh darn it, I could have done that. And that was a very, very powerful example of somebody being vulnerable. I don't think they were doing it intentionally, but it's an example of how you can show that it's expected that you're going to be learning in this process. You're teaching someone how to get the answers for themselves instead of just always giving them the answer and pretending like you know everything. When I talk to new engineers, I often joke about how like 90% of my job is just Googling stuff, and often they don't believe me. Uh, and I think the as you get more senior, you like get better at asking Google questions. Maybe you're asking like a few less questions, but I think vulnerability is this idea that you're still going to make mistakes, and it doesn't really matter how experienced you are, the stuff is still gonna happen. Uh, so another example of vulnerability is this from my coworker Phil. Uh, so he said, you know, hello, just lost a good 20 minutes trying to debug a Node app. I used exports.module, and Node apparently it's modules.export. And of course, since JavaScript is not a compiled language, you can't get that answer in less than 20 minutes unless you find the error that you were doing, right? Uh, so this got like 700 likes on Twitter. People love hearing stories about experienced people making mistakes. This is a really good way to build empathy and be vulnerable and build trust with the people in your community. So if you are somebody that's looking for like talk inspiration or blog post inspiration, I would love to see more Scala talks about how people fucked up. I don't think we get enough of that in this community. I think we get a lot of uh, talks about like, <sighs> yes, thank you. I will help all of you write an abstract about the mistakes that you have made, about how you have broken production with Scala, that would be fascinating. We could do an entire conference about that. Uh, but this is something that like, the learnings that you have from these types of experiences are really, really great to share. Uh, and this one kind of seems obvious to say, but like, I think a lot of people, this is what stops people from submitting a lot of like, conference talk proposals or writing blog posts about stuff. Uh, but I like to share this example uh, because this is like really basic knowledge. Uh, one of the things I do a lot in Twilio is write technical blog posts, but as part of that, the people on my team, we review each other's blog posts. And so I was reviewing my coworker Sam's blog post about um, something that he built with iOS and Swift. And in his blog post, he had this thing that was like, okay, now like test this on your device because it was something that you couldn't test in the, uh, in the Swift simulator. And I was like, well, how do you do that? Like, I took a Swift class. I've like done enough Swift to be slightly dangerous with it. But like, I'm not really an experienced Swift developer. And so I like Googled it and I had to look at eight different sites in order to get the answer that I needed. And so I wrote up this blog post about how to test your iOS application on a real device. This is my best performing Twilio blog post. This blog post gets thousands of views every single week. And so this is something that I'd like to share with people because 
it doesn't have to be something that you're like an expert on. It doesn't have to be like the most complicated technical topic for you to share your knowledge about something. I think that the basic concepts are really helpful to a lot of people, and this type of stuff should be shared more. Uh, and finally, the third piece of advice uh, for building a stronger community is to empower others. Uh, and this is all about making space for other people to participate. And this doesn't have to be a big gesture. In fact, one of my favorite recommendations for this is this idea of the Pac-Man rule. Does anybody know what the Pac-Man rule is? All right, my coworker knows because I stole this from my other coworker. <laughs> Uh, so this is the idea that if each one of these dots is a person, if you're at a physical event like a conference or a meetup, you want to leave physical space, you want to leave that Pac-Man opening for someone to join your conversation. And then when somebody does join the conversation, you expand the group and leave space for someone else to join. And so this is a very like, specific example of leaving like physical space for people to participate. But you can think about how this applies to online communities or other communities that you participate in. You really want to make it a possible for people to contribute to your community. Uh, from the keynote this morning, when you're talking about open source software, one way that open source communities have done this is by putting that like help wanted badge on GitHub issues. Uh, you know, like uh, this is a good issue for beginners is a way to signal for people that their participation is encouraged in that community. And that's that's kind of like the online example of leaving this physical space. But there's also ways that you can do this inside the workplace. Uh, so senior engineers aren't grown on trees, so one way that you can do this is to hire and train folks that don't have Scala experience. Uh, this also allows them to learn your systems and the way that you're building things. You don't necessarily need to hire people with uh, Scala experience in order for them to be effective members of your team. And your team will actually be stronger if you're willing to train people. Because by developing people who are good at the training and that are willing to learn those types of teaching exercises, you're going to foster a stronger team environment. And I don't have the best answer for how to develop a culture of this. Um, I'd love to talk to people if they had teams that are successful about this. I talked to a couple of people that work at the BBC yesterday who were saying that they do a lot of pair programming and that's one way that they encourage this kind of feedback culture. Uh, but one, one idea that I have is to make mentorship uh, an expectation for advancement in the workplace. Uh, and so this is something that you can do in order to like, get a promotion. You have to have shown experience or demonstrated the ability to train and mentor junior engineers on the team. If you're outside of the workplace, uh, there's a lot of other ways that you can contribute and give back to the community and empower others. Um, there's teaching opportunities at uh, events like ScholarBridge. You can either teach or plan a ScholarBridge event in your community. Uh, following the Pac-Man rule is a great way to engage with people at events like this. Uh, you can answer questions on Stack Overflow, coach someone on their meetup presentation. There's a lot of ways that you can give back. If you are interested in getting involved with ScholarBridge, uh, you can check out our website. Uh, we are also on Twitter. And then we have a Slack channel that uh, you can participate in. It's got several hundred members now, and it's a very, very great place to uh, get feedback on. There's a channel in there all about teaching Scala. There's definitely people in there that have planned and uh, coordinated other events. Uh, so you can DM me on Twitter for the invite link to that. Um, before I wrap up, I just I really want to personally thank these three people. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> so Noel, Yvonne, and Heather have really taken up the torch of um, Scala Bridge. And these three people have probably planned like 80% of the Scala Bridge events. Uh, so these are just like really, really awesome people. Noel created and maintains all the, the curriculum. Um, Heather has shepherded it just since her time as the executive director of the Scala Center. And Yvonne has basically like taken over Scala Bridge at this point. She unfortunately couldn't be at Scala Days this year, but I'm very, very grateful for all of these people. Um, I'm sorry for not recognizing everybody who has participated in ScholarBridge. Thank you very much for uh, everything that you've done. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, if you are looking for web communities to get involved with, um, 
These are great, great opportunities to get involved uh, online in communities that uh, aren't hostile. And so if you are a newer programmer or have people on your team that uh, are get, getting started with this type of thing, uh, Code Newbies is really great. Uh, Dev2 is kind of like kind of like hacker news, but like there's not assholes there. Uh, and so they, they do a really great job of like fostering a community. And these are not language specific or uh, anything like that, but there's a lot of uh, information on there and there's a lot of engagement on those platforms that allows people to participate in the communities. So a quick reminder of the things that you can do to build a better community. Uh, the Scala community is all of ours. And with a bit of kindness to ourselves and to each other, I think we can continue to thrive. Thank you. I'm not going to be taking questions right now, but I'll be right outside of the Twilio booth after. Thank you all for coming.